Okay, so we're going to be focusing specifically on physics-based simulation, right? Um, and by that, we're just going to be taking a virtual system. Uh, in the simplest case, we'll just call it a collection of line segments that are connected. We're going to give them physical properties and place those objects with physical properties under pressure so that um, if we let it run uh, long enough, the simulation will arrive at a very specific structure, right? So the elements that we're talking about here are uh, a kind of a base um, shape and pressure, right? And pressure really is just force. Any influence causing change in speed, direction, or shape. And um, when we're developing our simulations, um, in coordination with our forces, we'll be, we'll be assigning physical characteristics to the objects in our uh, CAD environment. So uh, we'll be working with physical objects. These are just anything with physical attributes uh, assigned to them, right? But that means that they are capable of being influenced by the forces in our scene. Uh, so um, in the last course, we talked about particles, right? Uh, not just points, but points that have additional properties, either weight or speed assigned to them. Uh, we also talked about springs, which are the kind of, uh, with particles, two of the uh, kind of primary physical objects that we'll be using most frequently, right? And springs want to um, move back to their original rest resting condition, right? So, um, you know, the deformation is equal to the force that is, is trying to um, use to d displace itself back to its original position. Right, so both are very simple physical objects. And what we're going to be looking at are uh, the types and ways to arrive at equilibrium shapes. Right? And an equilibrium shape is really just a form in which the sum of all the forces, those that are both internal and exterior, external, ends up being zero. Right? So um, a couple examples of that. Um, there may be a little bit more tangible if we're talking about equilibrium shapes, um, let's talk first about funiculars, right? Uh, we ended the last course on this uh, topic, and we'll kind of pick back up from, uh, from there now, right? And the, a funicular is just any shape that's, um, that is assumed under its own self-weight, right? There's a constant force in the world uh, that we know called gravity. Um, so any object that we have in the world that has uh, mass to it, right, will have to react to that property or force of gravity, right? So a funicular means we just hold up two ends of a chain at a certain location. We'll call that A and B. The chain will fall into a catenary curve, which is one type of funicular shape. Because these chain links have mass to them, that mass has to react to gravity, and uh, thereby the chain will relax into a shape um, that equalizes all of those forces under its own self-weight, right? So we have uh, the basic kind of elements of this diagram are that we have uh, anchor A and anchor B. These positions don't move. We have gravity, which is a constant. And then we have the force or forces moving through the chain uh, that are reacting to the mass times the force, right, which is the... Uh, I'm sorry, force divided by mass, right, which is the um, pressure given by gravity. Okay, so if we're comfortable with uh, funiculars and equilibrium shapes, right, and those are going to be our targets for today, uh, let's talk a little bit about the approaches to physics-based simulation, right? Uh, because we, there's all different ways we can go from here, um, but how exactly we do uh, will determine kind of what realm of um, of forms we'll be developing, as well as how we're going to interface with them as users, where we're going to allow the controls to be. So some of the key things that we want to be talking about today are the categories of the forms produced. Are they rigid or flexible? How are they dealing with forces? So what's going on with the internal forces uh, within that shape or, or the external forces? Are we applying any external forces? We'll also be talking about the states of our shapes, right? Are they at the initial or rest state, or are they at the current state, or have they reached equilibrium? And then uh, as we go, we'll have to be conscious very uh, specifically about the controls and constraints of our simulation, right? How are we going to interface with it? 
uh, with the simulation as it's running? Do we have any options to do that, or does it all have to be set up at the beginning? And where and what do we want to constrain within the simulation, right? What gets fixed and what is allowed to move? Okay, uh, one more um, kind of topic that we need to touch on or review before we um, dive into the exercises um, is that all of the exercises we'll be using today are going to be founded or kind of based upon meshes, right? And um, as a review of what that computational geometry type is, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the properties of, of meshes. And a mesh is just um, one type of geometry that is defined as a set of points, which are referred to as vertices, arranged into basic elements called faces. Right? So we have um, one vertex or a collection of vertices. Um, the connections are understood through um, their edges or their faces. And Rhino can only have quads or tries, right? Um, so the, the kind of elements that make up a mesh are the faces, edges, and vertices, as well as how exactly all those vertices are connected through faces and edges. That's called topology, right? And um, we can use, um, what, the way we're going to use them is that uh, we can use coarse uh, representations of a mesh, so that only have a few vertices and a few faces. Uh, so that the simulation will have relatively few controls. But what we will simulate will be far more interesting and allow us to get at um, more curvy and uh, complex shapes. Right, so um, the mesh elements that compose the mesh itself, right, we have a face now. It is described as the connection between vertices 1, 3, 6, and 4, right, has to be in this direction in order for this to be understood as out along the normal vector, right, the normal being the perpendicular direction to the mesh at that vertex, right, and the topology describes how those vertices are connected. So we have two shapes here that we see. These meshes are the same in that the topology is consistent. The connections don't change, but the location of the vertices do, right. So in one way we might think of this uh, for today's purposes as our initial state and these vectors being understood as forces that help us change the shape of the mesh while remaining, uh, while its topology remains consistent. Okay, so let's go ahead and install the uh, add-on kangaroo for Grasshopper, and this will be a way for uh, us to make sure that we have the current version, as well as use all of the additional uh, objects in Grasshopper from Kangaroo that allow us to embed physical behavior into our modeling environment and also interact with it live as the simulation is running, right? So um, the Kangaroo website says that it can be used for various sorts of optimization, structural analysis, animation, and more. So we'll be using simulation, which can it kind of relates to some of those things, and we'll also be focusing on animations here um, near the end of the course. All right, so if you haven't already, go ahead and uh, go over to Food for Rhino, uh, the website, and you're going to browse to the Kangaroo Physics um, add-on for Grasshopper and download. This should be version 0 0.085. All right, and what this is going to allow us to do is uh, use the Kangaroo Physics Engine, which we see here, in the context of Grasshopper. And... Um, We'll also be able to use the additional uh, forces and physical objects that are coming from the, um, the additional toolbars. Okay, so once we've installed it, um, we're going to go to, or sorry, once we've downloaded it, we're going to go to Rhino and we're going to uh, type in the command grasshopper folders. All right, so we'll do this together. Right, so I, I don't have um, Rhino launched quite yet, so I'm going to go ahead and launch Rhino 5. All right, and um, with Rhino 5 launched, um, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of these two toolbars real quick. I'm going to type in grasshopper folders, right? And this will give us the direct link to the folders um, on our C drive where all of the grasshopper objects are stored. 
So I'm going to go to components. So these are where all of our additional components are stored. And here's my download of my uh, Kangaroo Physics 0085. So I'm going to take these two files, Kangaroo Physics 0085 DLL and the .gha. And I'm going to copy them to the libraries folder. I'll go ahead and copy and replace them. That's fine. All right. So you'll now have uh, these two files in this folder. And the next part's really important. We need to right-click each one of these files, go to the properties, and choose unblock. Apply. Hit OK. And I can do that for the other file as well. This makes sure that the file is usable through Grasshopper. All right, so those are ready to, uh, ready to go. Let's go ahead and bounce up one level in the folder structure to Grasshopper and go to user objects. Right. With the download, uh, the developer, Daniel Piker, he's also um, created um, a series of user objects that we, can, um, that we can add to our toolbars as well. And those are going to be um, this collection here. We're going to copy them over to the user objects folder, copy and replace. All right. Now those objects will show up within the kangaroo toolbar as well. All right. So let's just go ahead and verify that kangaroo is working for us. Let's launch Grasshopper by typing in the command line. OK, I'm using version 9.14. I now have a kangaroo toolbar. And um, the physics engine is here so I can drop that onto the canvas looks like it uh, will work as well as all of the kangaroo user objects are here under utility right so if your toolbar does not look this large for the utility tab uh, make sure that you've got your uh, grasshopper folders um, you've copied your kangaroo user objects into the grasshopper uh, folders backslash user objects folder right all right, and if they're not showing up, you can always um, try and get Rhino to kind of uh, relink to all the files available. So you can close both Rhino and Grasshopper and relaunch it. All right, so I'll do that just to make sure. And we'll bounce back over to the presentation. Okay, so we launched Grasshopper folders to ensure that we have the right version. Uh, we copied our files over and we unblocked them by right-clicking.